I now invite Dr. Scott Woodward, president of Oblate School of Theology, to introduce tonight's presenter. Welcome, everyone. It's great to be here with you. I've been asked to introduce someone who really needs no introduction. Most of you know Father Ron Rollheiser quite well. Father Ron is the newly minted president emeritus at OST. He recently stepped down from the president's office after serving there for 15 years. And he continues to serve OST as professor of spirituality. He's the author of nearly 50 books, many of which have been translated into multiple languages. Last week, he handed me a copy of one of his books that was translated into Polish. Since neither one of us read Polish, we had no idea which of his books it was, but that's a fine problem to have if you're an author. Father Ron is a missionary oblate of Mary Immaculate. He's a fine human being. He's a prolific reader and a prolific writer. This pandemic has left him as someone who finds strength traveling to offer retreats and workshops around the world, stuck in San Antonio. So for now, he travels by Zoom. It's great for you and I, since we have him around more than usual. It's an honor to work with him and to know him as a friend, and I'm happy to introduce to you Father Ron Rollheiser. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for a very over generous introduction. And um, thank you all for, for tuning in here tonight, linking in. I want to thank Victoria, Luna, and Joel Birkenfeld who are organizing all of me. They're the people behind the scenes doing all the work. Um, I want to, I want to, let, let, I, I need to, sorry, I'm stuttering here. I need to share the screen here to, um, I'll get this organized. Not a great beginning. Okay. Whoops. Sorry, I'm, I'm stuttering here. I need to open my PowerPoint. Um, this is going to work. Trust me. Okay. Uh, There we are. Okay. Okay. Our, our series is called Generative Discipleship, the deeper, deeper secrets inside the Gospels. I want to talk first about the word just generative. That's a word that was put into a vocabulary in English by the, the, the wonderful psychologist Erickson. And Erickson used this word, um, there's, there's complex definitions of it. But in effect, what it means is um, generative means at the, those times of our life when we're carrying life, we're giving life rather than than asking to be carried and asking to and we're 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 in the taking thing, you know, um, or just simple uh, simpler image. When we're generative, we're breathing oxygen into this planet. When we're not generative, we're sucking oxygen out of this planet. So I want to look at generative discipleship and, and what I call some of the, the, the deeper secrets inside the Gospels. We're going to have three sessions. And tonight I want to look at the Synoptic Gospels, some of the deeper invitations inside the Synoptic Gospels. And the Synoptic Gospels, as you know, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You know, they, are, they wrote Gospels. They're different, but they're much, they're much more similar. And then next week, I will look at the Gospel of John just some of the deeper, and I'll call the deeper invitations, uh, which I'll try to draw out. And the last session, two weeks from tonight, I would look at two particular invitations. They're in the Gospels, but um, uh, they need to be teased out at some length. And that is the invitation to, as we get older and, and more mature, to ponder and to bless. Okay, so tonight we want to look at some of the deeper invitations inside the Synoptic Gospels. 
And I want to do a little two points of introduction just to contextualize this. I call it a double invitation vis-a-vis -vis discipleship. And the first one is this. You know, Jesus' invitation to discipleship is the same call for all. He doesn't call some to higher places and some to lower places and some to mediocre places. You know, we used to, and it's one of the things that Vatican II cleared up in the Roman Catholic Church. And that is up until Vatican II, we had a, a skewed theology or spirituality in which we felt that if God gave different calls, so for instance, become a priest or a sister was a higher call than to be married and to be a lay person. And we felt that there were different states in life of holiness. Uh, Vatican II happily melted that all down and correctly so. And those of you who are Protestants, uh, the Protestant the Reformation never accepted that to begin with. So there are no higher or lower states. It's not that God calls some, somebody to be Mother Teresa and somebody else who says, well, I'm satisfied if you're, if you're mediocre, you know. So there are no higher or lower places. But when I say generative discipleship, I want to refer to this. The invitation is always the same, but we hear it in very particular times and places in our lifetime. So as an example, it's one thing to hear the parable of the talents when you're 17 years old. It's another thing to hear it when you're 37 years old. It's another thing to hear it when you're 77 years old. Or to hear today we have the, the Martha Mary story, the, the, the gospel today. It's one thing to hear that, that story when you're a young person, a teenager, or you're just call, a college student. It's another thing to hear it when you're a young mother or father. It's another thing to hear it in retirement. It takes on different meanings. The story is the same, but we aren't the same. And very quickly, you know, um, this is based on mystics. It's also based on anthropology. But both the mystics and the great um, spiritual thinkers agree that there, there are three great or, or major stages to our lives. And these aren't hard to understand, and they're youth stages. There's what I call initial discipleship, which is the struggle to get our lives together. From the time we're a young kid until the, you really till we get married and settle down and have a career and start a raise, that, that, that's the initial stage. The struggle is to get our lives together, to answer questions like, who am I? Where am I going? Who will I marry? What will I do? How will my life turn out? Okay, see, we're, we're getting ready to be generative. Then the stage of generative discipleship, when we get married, we have kids, we have a career and so on. Uh, then the next 50 years of our lives are really the struggle to give our lives away. And then that's not the final stage because we don't stay on this planet forever. There's still the struggle finally to give our deaths away. I was gonna talk about two stages of this, but I wanna pass on to the second point here. See, that, that's particular times in our life, but we're also in particular places. You see down that little second bullet point where I say the distinction between essence and existence. You know, um, essence is what we are, and all human beings have the same essence. It did not, doesn't matter if your age, your gender, your race, your religion, um, everybody's born with the same essence for a human being. And in that sense, we all have some common struggles. But then each of us has existence, what we call an existential situation of time, place, gender, economic status, health, self-image, psychological and, and physical gifts, and our wounds. You know, this is a huge thing. You know, like I said, we don't hear the gospel. We hear it at different times of our lives. Also, people hear the gospel in very different places in their lives. Just to give a couple of examples. It's a wonderful scripture scholar at CTU in Chicago, Barbara Reed. And a few years ago, she did a sabbatical, but she went down to Latin America and went to some very poor barrios. And she would sit with women in, 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 in poverty areas and, and read scripture to them, say, what does this gospel text mean to you? Well, that's very different than reading it to a woman, you know, in, in, in Madison Avenue in New York, who's going to church on Sunday, you know, or, or even to be more graphic. We hear God's challenge and the invitations, but imagine somebody who's been sexually abused as a child, 
they're going to hear it very differently than somebody who hasn't been sexually abused. Or imagine somebody, you were the star in high school, you were the quarterback, you were the most popular guy in school, or you were the person who was beat up on the playground who couldn't get a, a, a date for your prom. Or, you know, you were the prom queen, but this other girl is being bullied by all, all of her classmates. That's their existential situation. Or whether we're in this country, whether we're white, whether we're black, whether we're Hispanic, whether we're Chinese and Asian, all, or whether even if we're male or female, it makes a big difference in our health. Are you healthy? Do we have some condition? Are you, are you a cancer patient? You know, um, see all of these things are, are that the, the psychological gifts and our physical gifts and our wounds, all of that make a very big difference on how the gospel comes to us. The gospel is the same but we aren't always the same. So I want to do that. That's the first point. Secondly, before we go into the scripture things, I want to just talk about um, an overarching thing today, you know, because I'm going to look at some invitations this week from the synoptics, next week from John's gospel, um, deeper invitations to become generative, but I want to uh, put it under this canopy. Today, there's a, an imperative for a new maturity in our world, and especially for a new Christian maturity. Let me explain that. Today we live, certainly in the Western world and in, in the developed parts of the world, um, the secularized parts of the world, we live with a new freedom, and we live with a freedom that no human beings ever enjoyed this before. There weren't any kings or queens or popes in medieval ages who had the freedom that you have that have the access to things that you have, you know. Um, popes and medieval kings and Henry VIII, they didn't get on airplanes or fly to the Bahamas for a weekend and so on. We, we have this tremendous freedom, but as I want to suggest, that demands a much deeper maturity. Um, the second bullet point where I talk about our, our, the power of our culture. I want to do this with a little story. Some years ago, listening on a radio program and they were interviewing a man and his wife and they had been journalists they're american couple but they were journalists and that lived in paris for 11 years and while they were in paris their son was born he was now nine and they were you know a, an artsy couple intellectual couple and so on so they talked about living in paris and the culture there and how they didn't own a television set <clears throat> and how they were completely out, completely out of the loop of uh, popular culture. So their son, now nine, he didn't know who all the rock stars are and Taylor Swift and the Kardashians and on and on. He was just completely, he knew about medieval artists, and French museums. So now they moved back to New York City. And so the, the interviewer asked this couple, he said, your son, they said, has he held out against pop culture. And the couple laughed and the man said, well, he held out for about two weeks. He said, but of course he didn't hold out. He said, because nobody does. He said, pop culture, not just American culture, but pop culture, everything from Hollywood to the rock scene, to the to People magazine, to Starbucks coffee, to um, the foods and so on. He said, it's the most powerful narcotic that's ever been perpetrated on this planet for good and for bad, social media and so on. It's just, it's a powerful narcotic. It does a lot of good, but it also, it, it, it holds us. We're not free from it, you know? So how do we get free from that? Carl Rahner, and many of you are familiar with this line, he said that a generation ago, Carl Rahner says in the next generation, and he's talking about us, because he said that 50 years ago, that the next generation, you're either going to be a mystic or you're going to be a non-believer. And what he meant by that is not that you're going to need to have, you know, you know, mystical experiences where Jesus appears to you or whatever. He meant this. You're going to have to be powerfully rooted in your lonely self, in your individual self, in faith, or you're not going to have it. Why? Because the culture is no longer going to carry it for you. Nobody's going to carry it for you, not even your spouse necessarily. You know, I touch an older generation. I grew up in West Central Canada, 
in an immigrant community. When I was a kid, everybody on a Sunday morning, everybody in the entire community went to church unless they were sick or had some major reason. Okay. You had to be a deviant to not go to church on a Sunday. I look at my nephews and nieces one generation later, it's the complete opposite. They have to be deviants to go to church on a Sunday. You know, when I was a kid, you didn't need to be a mystic. Society, your family carried the church for you, the faith. Today, it doesn't. So it requires a, a new maturity. And um, I'm going to come back to Henry and I'm going to skip to Jesus. And the new maturity is this, that, you know, and this is where, where liberals and conservatives sometimes both get it wrong, you know. Conservatives get this, that, you know, the, the danger of our culture, but then they say we, we, we have to somehow limit our freedom. And liberals tend to say freedom is good, go into all dark places because you can go there. Well, Jesus is actually the model, the ultimate model of maturity. You know, Jesus went everywhere. And that was, that's not an abstract concept. You know, he went into the singles bars of his time. He went to the prostitutes' houses, you know, except he didn't sin. Um, today, we tend to everywhere except we do sin. You know, and see what we need to come to, just using a paradigm, is the maturity of Jesus, where we, we can go places, we, we can walk as free women, men on this planet, but at the same time, we can model maturity that's required. And, the, and incidentally, that more than anything else is what young people are looking for us for. That's what your kids are unconsciously look, looking to you for. They're looking, how do you carry this? How do you show that you can walk in this, all this, this, this complex secularity we walk in and all this wonderful freedom and yet never abuse it or never abuse anybody? And one of the things that I want to say here is that like Henry Nouwen, as you know, was one of the great, probably great. He was no doubt the most popular spiritual writer in the last half century, certainly in English. Okay. Uh, but one of the things about Nouwen, which made him so deep, he was always very honest about his own struggles. Nouwen was always a saint, but in progress. And so he was always very honest about his struggles. And during the last years of his life, sometimes or oftentimes he wouldn't travel alone. If he went to give talks, he would take one of the core members from the large community with him. And he always camouflaged that by saying, well, you know, I want to bring the, the large community with me and so on. But also in his books and in personal friendships, he was very honest. He said, that's not the only reason. He said, you know why I don't travel alone? He said, there are times when I'm not mature enough to travel alone. He said, I'm too immature sometimes to travel alone. He said, bluntly put, if I'm in a hotel room and there's a thousand uh, channels and there's pornography on a channel, if I'm alone, I might watch it. If I'm with somebody, I might, won't watch it. See that, and that's true for all of us. It has to be with an honesty. You know, our, our need to move to maturity is to begin with an honesty about our immaturity. It's like 12 step programs. You, you can't be cured of anything until you admit you have a problem. And I think today we should have, um, like to have AA groups, we should have um, groups for immaturity where you go, hi, my name is Ron and I'm an immature person. I need help. Then we can move to it. Okay, now with that being said, let's go into the Synoptic Gospels and some of the deeper invitations that um, you know, there's a lot of invitations of the gospel. I want to pull some out that I think have an extra depth to them and that call us to a deeper generativity in our life and to a deeper faith. And the first one is the, uh, to, to, the image of the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. Um, that's one of my favorite passages in all of scripture. And... Um, uh, and it's almost like a gospel inside of a gospel. You know, there was a student in, in Louvain in Belgium, and the famous professor Skilovex, he didn't teach in Louvain, but sometimes he would come down for conferences. So, of course, you know, we were all his groupies, and we were in the front rows as he spoke. And one time somebody asked us, Professor Skilovex, if you had to name one text, just one text that, that really should speak to us today, what is it? And he didn't even hesitate. He said, Luke 24. He said, 
we're on the road to Emmaus. Okay, what is the road to Emmaus? Let me give you the text and we'll parse it. It's in Luke 24 and it begins this way. Okay, and, and, and set up, he's already announced the resurrection. He's told everybody Jesus has risen from the dead. So we know it, but the people in the story are not going to know it. So Luke starts this, the story this way. He said, on the morning of the first day of the week, but it's the morning Jesus rose from the dead. He said, on the morning of the first day of the week, two disciples were walking away from Jerusalem towards the Maos, a village some seven miles away. As they're walking with their faces downcast, as they're walking, Jesus begins to walk with them on the road, but their eyes are, are, are blocked and they can't recognize Jesus. So he says to them, why are you so downcast? Why this, you know, heaviness? And one of them, Cleophas by name, says, you must be the only person in all of Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened these last days. Jesus says, what's happened? And he says, about Jesus of Nazareth, whom we had hoped, past perfect tense, we had hoped that he would be the Messiah, but the Romans crucified him and humiliated him. And now it's the third day after this, and uh, some women in our group believe they've seen him, but we don't believe them. And then in the harshest words that Jesus speaks in the whole Gospel of Luke, because Luke has a very gentle Jesus. Luke says, you senseless, stupid people. He said, wasn't it necessary that the Christ should so suffer and die? He said, then he began with the beginning of Scripture, and he reinterpreted all of Scripture, to show that the crucifixion didn't make not didn't just make sense; it was very necessary, and they kind of get it, so they're intrigued with what he's saying, and they get to Emmaus, and they, he makes as if to go on. They say, "No, stay with us for the night." So he sits down, said, and then when they break the bread, it's a clear Eucharistic text. When they break, they celebrate Eucharist. Their eyes are opened; they recognize him, and. He immediately disappears, and then that night they're right back to Jerusalem. He said, we've seen Jesus, um, our hearts burned within him, and we recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Let's unpack that text, which is very dense, right from the beginning. First of all, Luke says, on the morning of the first day. Now, it's a double meaning. He's talking about Sunday. Sunday is the first day of the week, okay? But he means it in a deeper way. Jesus just risen, he said, on the morning of the first day, Luke says, the world is starting over. Time is starting over. You know, if you read Genesis, on the first day, light separated from darkness. It was the first day of, of this planet, of this world. Okay. Now, Luke is saying it's starting over. And you know, that's, that might sound very far-fetched, except it's not. You know, we measure time by that. We are in the year 2020 since this happened. You know, so you know what he's talking about. He says, uh, on the first day, that was the first day where our clock began for the whole world. We're in 2020 since Jesus' resurrection. You know, he said, and then two disciples are walking away from Jerusalem. Now, it's interesting. In, in the Gospels, as we're going to see, geography almost always means more than geography. So Jerusalem isn't just a city. It's three things in Luke. Jerusalem means the church. Jerusalem means their faith dream. And Jerusalem means the place where Christ is crucified. So Luke said, these two disciples, they're walking away. They're leaving the church. They're walking away from the church. They're leaving their faith and they're leaving the place where Jesus was humiliated, was humiliated you know. And they're walking towards the Maos. You know, <laughs> I always find it humorous when we have religious houses called the Maos. And Maos was a Roman spa. It was Las Vegas. See, so what Luke is saying, they were discouraged. Their Jesus had been crucified. And they were leaving the church. They were leaving their faith and they're walking towards Las Vegas. They were walking towards a place of worldly consolation. But you're going to see Jesus finds them on the road, you know. And so they're walking, they meet Jesus, but they don't recognize him. Why not? He's only been dead for a day and a half. Well, the reason they don't recognize him is not because he looks different. They don't have the eyes to see. They could only see Jesus the way he had been with them once. You know, you see, Jesus, many Jesus we believe in get crucified. 
Jesus is always alive, walking with us. So Jesus says to them, why are you so downcast? And then one of them, Cleopas by name, and these weren't the 12 apostles. This was Cleopas and his wife. Okay, it was a man and a woman. They say to him, you must be the only person who doesn't know what's happening, which is powerfully ironic because he's the only person who does know what's happening. Okay, but he plays dumb. He said, what's happening? He said, about Jesus of Nazareth, whom we had hoped. See, we had hung all our hopes in him. He got killed, and so the dream is over. We're leaving the church. We're going for human consolation. You know, um, we're going to go to Vegas. Now, then Jesus says, uh, in, in this harsh thing, he says, you senseless, stupid people. Now, he's not just making it up. That, that is, he's quoting the Psalms. In the Psalms, they say, the fool, the stupid person says in his heart, there is no God. Whenever God doesn't meet our expectation, <clears throat> the fool says, well, there isn't any God. So Jesus says, you're like that, he said. And then he says, wasn't it necessary? You know, like, you see that my death is a stumbling block, when in fact, if you think it through, it's, it's the, the, the crown jewel, that's what has to happen. You know, that you can't get to Easter Sunday without going through Good Friday. Well, that's another whole homily and so on. And then he tries to explain it to them using all of scripture. And they said, they kind of get it. Their hearts are burning within them, but they don't really get it. But they get it enough to stay with them and ask him, stay with us. So Jesus is restructuring their imagination, you know. Um, and then it's a clear Eucharistic text, you know. They said, then in the breaking of the bread, as they sat down, they recognized him. When they celebrated Eucharist, they recognized him. And immediately he disappears. And they immediately they go back to their faith dream. They go back to Jerusalem. They go back inside the church and so on. Now, that's a paradigm for how faith works in an adult life. You know, the, as we go through life, you know, different Jesuses get crucified in our lives. You know, I grew up in the in the fifties, and it was a pre-Vatican II. It was a white Jesus. There was a, a lot of things about the Jesus which were wonderful, you know. But that Jesus got crucified thoroughly. But Jesus isn't dead. Jesus is alive and walking, you know. And um, and we always have to restructure our religious imagination by using Scripture. You know, Scripture constantly restructures it. But then. Beyond that, we need the Eucharist. And see, in the Eucharist, we, we, it, 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 it constellates the word into, to, into a deeper understanding. Now, let me say something that's very important here. You know, in all churches, Catholics and Protestants, we say we sustain our faith in two things, through the Eucharist and the word, except that Catholics and Protestants, they cut this differently, you know, and you can see it in the way we build our churches. For Roman Catholics and Episcopalians, the Eucharist is central and the word is, it sets up the Eucharist. In Protestant churches, evangelical churches, the opposite. The word is central, which sets up the, the um, and the Eucharist is secondary. And you can see it right the way we build our churches. When you walk in a Roman Catholic church, an Episcopalian church, an Anglican church, the altar is the center. It pulls you together. And the lectern, the word is off to the side. When you walk in a Protestant church, the lectern's at the center and the word is off to the side. Okay, no matter which way we prioritize them, uh, see, you see, you see in this text how our faith is nurtured through the word and through the Eucharist, you know, and that, uh, and, and, and also this, this would be more Roman Catholic in terms of that you see the centrality of the Eucharist. With the word, they kind of get it but they don't really get it until they celebrate Eucharist. You know, um, there's a wonderful book by a British theologian called Ronald Knox. It's an older book now and in it, on the Eucharist. And he says, the Eucharist is our one great act of fidelity. Actually, I stole the title of my book on Eucharist from him, you know, but and so Knox says this, Knox says, you know, as Christians, we've never really taken Jesus seriously. He said, we, we don't turn the other cheek. We don't love our enemies. We don't forgive each other. We don't take care of the poor. He said, there, there's a lot of, lot of gaps in our discipleship. He said, but we have been faithful in one great way. 
the Eucharist. When Jesus left, he said, keep the Eucharist going till I come back. 2,000 years later, they've kept the Eucharist going. And you know something? It's going to save us all. The word of the Eucharist. Just keep reading the word. Keep coming back to the Eucharist. And it pulls us back. It restructures our imagination as different Jesuses and different faith dreams die in our lives. Um, we have to understand we're on the road to Mass. Um, and, you know, and the, the, I think there's a wonderful um, human element there where he says, you know, what happens to us normally when we get depressed? In our faith, we try to head towards human consolation, and we didn't ever get there because Jesus finds us in the road and brings us back. So that's the first text: the invitation to be on the road to Emmaus, to to find Jesus on the road as we're walking around in our depressions, you know, looking looking for uh, to refine our faith. The second one is the invitation to stand with Jesus in the borders of Samaria as we struggle with a dual identity and dual loyalties. The, the text is given in Mark and it's also given in Matthew. <clears throat> Let me give you the text. And then um, <clears throat> they say one day Jesus was on the borders of Samaria when he met a woman. Okay. The woman, and actually we could stop the text right there. You know, um, <clears throat> you already get the, the sense of the text. Like I said, in, in, in the gospels, Remember, geography is almost always more than geography. You know, it's not just a place on a map. So borders means what? Borders means edges. Jesus was in the edges of something, which is what? Samaria. Samaria was a different ethnicity. Samaria was a different religion. And he meets a woman who's a different gender. If someone said to me, where is the church? And where are all the churches standing today, Christian churches, as they were on the borders of Samaria? We're on the borders of ethnicity as the world becomes more global and polyethnic. And, you know, um, we're on the borders of ethnicity. We're on the borders of religion, you know. And if 9-11 and in our, in our, in our present tension with Islam hasn't woken us up, we're not going to get it. And also we're on the borders of gender. The women's question is not going to go away. What's going to dominate the church for the next 50 years, ethnicity, religion, gender, we're on those borders. So Jesus is standing there, okay? Now, let's take the story. This woman who's a Syrophoenician. Now, it's not so important that she's Syrophoenician. What's important? She's not a Jew. He's a Jew, okay? And he's the Jewish Messiah. She comes up to him and says, Jesus, son of David. That's his Jewish Messiah title, says, have mercy on me and cure my daughter who's very sick. And then in one of the more curious responses, Jesus is going to give in scripture. Jesus says, no. He gives her a flat rejection. He said, no. He said, I've been sent only to the lost tribes of, tribes of the house of Israel. He said, and it's not fair to take the bread of the children and to give it to the house dogs. I'll say, it's not a wonderful pastoral line. Someone comes up and says, Father, can you help me? He says, no, I don't work with dogs. I just work with the Roman Catholics, you know. Um, so he says, uh, I, I can't do this, you know. Um, he said, I've sent, I'm sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And we don't take the bread of children for the house dogs. Now, she is a pretty resilient woman. She doesn't say, well, there's going to be a lawsuit about this. Wait until, you know, you know, uh, you know the, the, the human commission hears about that and so on. Wait till I get this on the news at night. Instead, she says, Ah, yes, Lord Adonai. Now, notice she calls him by a different name. She says, But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And Jesus is completely reversed. And he's thinking, he's, Ah, he said, In all of Israel, I never saw faith like yours. And he gives you the miracle. What happened there? Okay, let's take this from the top. Okay, he is the Jewish Messiah. This woman who's a Samaritan, Syrophoenician, comes up to him and says, you know, are you the Jewish Messiah? He says, yes. Can you help? And he says, no. Okay. Now, but let's, let's um, play with this a little bit. Imagine, those of you who are Roman Catholic or whatever your religion, imagine you're working in a baptismal program in your parish. Those of you who are Roman Catholic, you're working with the RCIA. And so you've you, you started in fall at Labor Day, and you've prepared... 15 people who want to enter the church, you've had all this long process 
and so on. And, and now it's the vigil mass on Holy Saturday. And they're all going to be baptized and confirmed. And there's a lot of excitement in the church. They're away on retreat. And you're the person and you're putting water into the baptismal tub. And as you're doing this, some woman comes up whom you've never seen before. And she says, uh, do you run the RCAA here? Are you in charge of this baptismal program? And you say, yes. She said, I'd like to be baptized tonight. Well, I don't like her chances. Because you'd say like Jesus said, no, no, I was working with this group. <laughs> This group, but we've been working together for this whole time, this RCIA and so on, and, and you're not part of the group. And so I I'm I'm I hit up this group and, and you're not part of this group and so on. And so come back on Monday, we'll take your name, and you can get into the next group and so on. So this woman says, Sorry, sorry, ma'am. I just obviously misaddressed you. I said you're not just the leader of this baptismal program, are you? Aren't you also a universal instrument by God for all people, not just for those who take your program? Aren't you put here by God to take care of everybody? Now, if you're like Jesus, you'd say, yes. She said, well, then I'm one of yours. I never took the program, but I'm one of yours. And then if you were like Jesus, you might say, wow, you missed all this training and you're more ready than anybody who took the training. So stand in line, you get it first, you know? See this woman, she said to Jesus, could, could I cash in on this, this Jewish thing? And he says, no, you, you've skipped like about 700 years of Jewish training. And she said, um, okay, sorry, you're not just the Jewish Messiah. Adonai means you're the universal Lord. Aren't you the universal savior for all people, whether they're Jews or not? Jesus says, yes, I am. said, well, then I'm one of yours. Then Jesus says, wow. You skipped 700 years of training. You're more ready than the people who took the training. And he gives her the miracle. Now, the lesson in there is not so much, you know, do you baptize or not baptize? It's much deeper than that. You know, th th this is the lesson. Jesus has those two identities. And that's a powerful tension in the Gospels. It's also a powerful tension in the early church. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah but he's also the universal salvation person for all people, the savior of all people. And that, that's a tension inside of him, okay? And she calls him out of one rubric into the other rubric where he goes and so on. Now, um, I wanna do a little footnote on the dogs and I wanna apply This is very, very important for all of our lives in the churches. You know, uh, just a note on, on the, the role of the dogs where he said, it's not fair to take the bread of the children and give it to the house dogs. Okay, sounds cruel, but scholars do two things with that. First of all, we suspect that this was banter, that this was healthy banter. You know, sometimes when people actually like each other, they can have a very robust conversation. You can kind of slam the other person, they slam back. And so, so Jesus kind of lays a heavy on her. He says, not fair to take the bread of the children and give it to the house dogs. But she gets them back better than he got her. Because the Jews and Gentiles had different rules about dogs. In a Jewish house, the dog never went in the house. In a Gentile house, the dogs were in the house and usually under the table, because that's where the scraps were, you know? So he says, you know, we don't give crumbs to dogs. And she said, you're right. If you're a Jew and you're an idiot, you know, you'd have to go out of the house. But in a Gentile house, the dogs under the table, you just slip from the tree. You don't have to even get up. You know, now that's the banter, but there's a deep thing to this. This is the deep part. You know, Jesus is saying, I am the Jewish Messiah and you're not in that house. She says, to, to serve you, I'd have to step out of my Judaism. And she says, no, you don't. I'm already in your house. You know, let me just tease that out. And I'm a Roman Catholic priest. Suppose a Buddhist comes to me and says, you know, Father, can you do our marriage? And actually, that has happened, you know. I can say, well, no, no, I, I'm a Roman Catholic priest. And, you know, I'd have to step out of canon law. I'd have to, get, you know, get bishop's permission and all that. And they, and they say, no, you don't, you know. Um, are, are you only a priest or are you also a universal instrument of salvation for all people, for God? You know, see, the church, is the Roman Catholic Church to serve only Roman Catholics? Or the Episcopalian Church only the Episcopalian? No, we... 
we, yes and no. See, we, we serve our own, but we're, we're larger than that. See, because we notice Jesus has those two identities. He is the son of David, and he's very loyal to that. I've been sent to save the Jews, but he's not just that. He's also Adonai. He's been sent to save everybody. But, you know, and that's a tension in his life. But, you know, it's also a tension in our lives. Each of you tonight, man, woman, okay? If you're a woman, I don't care what your domination is, you are a daughter of David, which means whatever you're imagining, you're Roman Catholic. You're a Roman Catholic under Pope Francis, under the bishop, under canon law, under all of this, and you can't just blow that identity off, you know? But at the same time, you're not only that. You are a universal instrument of salvation that takes you beyond Catholicism, beyond Christianity, beyond everything, you know? And you need to always keep that intention. Now, I was very, very lucky that the first 12 years of my priesthood, I served in the Archdiocese of Edmond at the seminary there. And at the time, we had a wonderful archbishop. I think they've thrown away the mold of these people and so on. But he would teach that to all of us, both theoretically and pastorally. You know, if you phone him with a pastoral problem, so for instance, I phone him and say, your grace, I got this, this issue here with this couple or whatever. He said, and, you know, what do I do? He'd always say, Father, don't ask me. Don't ask me. He says, you know the mind of the church. You know what should be done here. But he says, on the other hand, you also are looking at them and their pain and their unique situation. And you bring those two together. You make that decision. Notice he's saying, you're standing before them. You are a son of David. You can't just blow this off. But you're also Adonai. And you can't just blow that off. Okay. He said, bring them together. He says, tell me afterwards. If I don't like what you do, I'll tell you after the fact. You know? But that's true for all of us. We, we, we have this torn identity, and it's meant to be torn, which I said today is particularly true because we're standing on new borders of religion, ethnicity, and gender, you know. So we have the old rules. We have canon law. We have our denominational things and so on, and they're important. But there's another whole side to it. It's also Adonai. So this is a very far-reaching text. So it invites Christians, you know, for us to always struggle and to with this tension that we're, we're both things. Be fiercely loyal to your church, but you're not just your church. Also be fiercely loyal to this other identity. As a woman or a man, you are a universal instrument of salvation for everybody. Buddhists, Hindus, straight, gay, black, white, everybody. And, um, um, the Roman Catholic or Episcopalian or, or, or no religion at all, it doesn't matter. They're still your people. And that's the tension. There's just a little story on this in numerous. Is, uh, when Tony Blair um, was prime minister in England, and Tony Blair is an Anglican, Episcopalian, and his wife and children are Roman Catholic. <clears throat> but for years, he'd go to mass with his wife and kids and go to communion. In fact, Pope John Paul gave him communion a couple of times. But at one stage in his life, um, the, the parish priest in Westminster that they went to changed. And this new priest wasn't so sure about this. So he, he phoned the bishop and he said, you know, I have Tony Blair, he's the prime minister. Everybody knows who he is. Everybody knows he's not Roman Catholic. He comes to mass and he comes to communion. So what do I do? Well, the bishop gave him good advice. The bishop said, now this is a pastoral problem and you're the pastor. So I want you to pray about it, and you decide what should be done here. So about a week later, he phones the priest and said, well, how do you decide this? So the priest said, well, I did this. I went to chapel. I knelt down and I asked myself, what would Jesus do? And the bishop said, God, you did it. Surely you didn't do that. Okay. Now, uh, that's a good question. What would Jesus do? Remember that bracelet? But, you wish, but notice Jesus was complex. Jesus did it sometimes this way, sometimes did it the other way, sometimes he started one way and finished the second way. It's a good question. What would Jesus do? Jesus had a torn identity. He had torn loyalties, and so do we. Uh, and so it makes, it makes our, our, our religious life and our discipleship complex, it's supposed to be complex. Okay, third story. The gospel invitation to the rich young man. 
that's in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And you know the story. But let me tell you the story. It'd be interesting if you were hearing the story for the first time, okay? Where, um, this, because we, we already call him the rich young man, and we already villainized this man, and, you know, we're going to see he's a pretty good man. He shouldn't be villainized. But the story goes this way. I'll take Luke's account, which is the fullest. Luke says, one day, a young man comes up to Jesus, and he does reverence to Jesus. He bows and he says, good master, what must I do to possess eternal life? And Jesus gives two corrections. Jesus says, don't call me good. He said, nobody's good except God. He said, what does scripture say? The young man says, scripture says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, um, I've already been doing that. Now what? So Jesus gives a second correction. He said, now if you would receive eternal life. There was a little play on verbs there. The man comes up to Jesus and said, what must I do to possess eternal life? You know, it's an interesting verb. He said, like, because he's thinking of eternal life as possession you could have and you could have, you know, you could possess it. Like you put grain into a barn or you put jewelry into a box or you put money into a bank. You put a safe, um, a life insurance thing in a safety deposit box, you have it. You have that security. He says, how can I have the security about eternal life? Jesus said, well, you can't. That's not the way it works. He said, you can receive eternal life. The way you can breathe air. The way you can drink, drink water. Air and water are free. Come to the water. There's no money, no price. Come to the well. Eternal life is completely free and it's accessible as air. Except you have to breathe it. You have to cook yourself up correctly. You know, It's not something you possess. No sense putting air into a safety deposit box. It's free. No sense putting, possessing eternal life. It's it's there. It's free. It's access. It's accessible. But now that's that's the minor homily. But he says, if that's the case, he said to the young man, for you, you have to give up everything. And here the key word is everything. Why? Because you'll see he had given up almost everything. Notice he was a very good young man. This is not somebody asking for first conversion. See, you know, the prodigal son, my life's been a mess. What I do? He said, I'm keeping the commandments. I'm going to church. I'm loving my neighbor. I'm doing everything right, you know? So I'm doing seemingly everything. So what should the Jews say? Well, you have to give it everything. Then the text that he went away sad because he was very rich. He couldn't give up everything. Now, I want to... Uh, move into the lesson of the story by by looking at, at homily from the desert fathers this little text i have in front of you it's a homily from the desert fathers they said abba lot went to see abba joseph and said father according as i am able i keep my little rule my little fast my prayer meditation contemplative silence and according as i am able i strive to cleanse my heart of bad thoughts now what more should i do the elder rose up in reply, stretched out his hands to heaven, and his fingers became like lamps of fire, and he said, why not become all flame? This is perfect interpretation, rich young man. He said to Jesus, like, I keep the fast, I'm going to church, I'm doing all this stuff, what should I do? He says, why not become all flame? What does it mean to be all flame? I want to tell you a story. It's a good story. And I hope the story isn't going to scandalize you in some way and so on, but it's a good story. It's very illustrative. Some years ago, I was preaching a retreat to a group of diocesan priests, large group of priests in large dioceses, large dioceses. And our retreat began Monday night, and then Tuesday in the evening after the talk, five of the priests asked me to join their support group. They said, we always meet Tuesday night, come join our support group. So I did. It was a very interesting experience. Went into this breakout room and they had some beer and scotch and some finger foods and so on. But before they got to the beer and scotch and finger foods, they did something very interesting. They all went to publicly con to confession to each other and confessed all the faults to the mildest detail that they had done in this last week. They just cleansed their souls. You know. Then they got into the beer and scotch and so on. And then the man who started this group said, Father, he said, I started this group. I started it five years ago. And I started it for this reason. He said, 
I was a good priest, but I wasn't a great priest. So I can tell you the reasons for both. He said, I was a good priest. I went to the seminary. He said, I was sincere. He said, I gave myself over to the studies as best I could. He said, I was ordained. Bishop put me for a couple of years into a city parish as an assistant. He said, I worked really hard. He said, then he put me in the country with five rural parishes, which was way too much work. He said, but I did it. And he said, I killed myself. He said, I literally, I was go going, working myself to death. He said, you know something, the people loved me. They thought it was Francis of Assisi. You know, he said, they applied me with every kind of gift and every kind of compliment and so on. He said, I could have walked in water. He said, but I was a good priest. He said, but I wasn't a great priest. And I'll tell you why. <clears throat> he said, I was doing all this good work. I was killing myself for God. He said, but I kept some compensations. He said, because they actually made everything else work. He said, I had three compensations. He said, one was anger. I was angry at the bishop, carried a lot of anger against people. He said, of course, I loved my parishioners because they loved me. He said, but there was a lot of anger inside of me, you know. And he, he said, secondly, he says, um, uh, I compensated in lifestyle. He said, I was a young priest. His priest salary isn't great, he said, but I had nothing else to spend it on. So I took expensive holidays. I went to expensive restaurants. I bought expensive scotch. I bought expensive wines. I bought every kind of CD and... And, you know, every kind of electronic gadget you can get, he said, I, 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 I pampered myself. He said, then the third one was this. He says, you know, I handled my celibacy. How I handled all the tension in my life. He said, I handled it through masturbation. He said, so here I am. I'm a priest with a lot of celibacy. And he says, I'm a good priest, but I'm not a great priest. He said, you know, these three things that the irony is, the three compensations made everything else work. And he said that began to change with my dad's death. He said, I drove across the state, you know, buried my father whom I who had great love and respect for. He said, and I was driving home in the car, I was praying, I was crying. I thought, no, no more compensations. I'm gonna be, I'm, I'm gonna not do this anymore. And he said, um, but he said, foolishly at, you know, I thought I could do this by willpower at to learn what, what alcoholics, anonymous people learn. You can't change your, life just by willpower you need grace and community so he called his closest friends together and now they all did it okay and they do this and their stories were similar you know i was a good priest wasn't a great priest now i'm trying to be a great priest and the youngest man in the group was only 38 he says father i joined this group just three years ago and he says that's the hardest thing i've ever done in my life he said not going to confession he said but being 38 years old and trying to live like Mother Teresa, he said, that's hard, that's hard. But he said this, but it's also the best thing I've ever done in my life. He said, I have never been this happy. It's the best thing I've ever done. I've never been this happy. I'll give you a quote from Leon Blois, who was a famous French philosopher, very influential and in influenced the Maritans. And he says this, he said, there's ultimately only one true sadness in life, and it's the sadness of not being a saint. Notice this young man said, I've never been happier in my life. 38 years old, trying to live like Mother Teresa. Not always getting it right, but trying. The rich young man is doing all this, but he's going away sad because he couldn't give up those last areas. You know, the young man who started this group, he said, he said, Father, you know, I look at my, my soul. You look at any soul. He said, and look at like like a house. He said, imagine, like, like Teresa of Avila said, imagine your soul is a, a mansion with, with 30 rooms. So your soul is a house with 30 rooms. He said, I had given 27 of those to God. He said, but I've kept three. I kept three. You know, that's the rich young man standing in front of Jesus. He said, look, I'm doing almost everything for you. So what do you want? More do you want now? Why not become all things? Why not everything? You know, for good people, that's you people, that's us on this call tonight. We're good people, but you know, but a lot of us aren't great, but a lot of times we're not great people. You know, Mother Teresa stand out. Why? Because they give up their whole house and we kind of give up most of it, <laughs> which makes us very good people, but not great people. This guy said, I was a good priest, but I wasn't a great priest. And uh, I think that's true. Most of us, we're good Christians. We're not necessarily great Christians. And what we need is um, to give it all over. 
because the guy said, he said, I had a mansion, my soul, 30 rooms. I've given 27 of those to God, but I kept three. And he says, and the reason I kept them, you know where we keep these? Because they make everything else work. He said, so if you ask yourself, what if I give them up, how will I handle tension? How will I, you know? He said, the trouble is you don't find that out until you do it. Incidentally, that's why I say, these are the deeper invitations. You know, when, when Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he finds a single one of great price, he sells all that he has in exchange for it. Now, this isn't the case here. You know, that merchant, he gets to see what he's going to buy. He rolls the dice, but he knows what he's going to get. This young man said, if I give up these compensations, how will I cope? He said, the answer comes from God. You just have to do it. You have to do it blindly. You have to do it in blind trust. And God will provide, but you don't get to see how it's going to work. See, that's spirituality at a second level. Okay, I had a couple of others, but I noticed it's, it's, it's 8 o'clock. And um, so I want to leave the last, you know, 25, 30 minutes here for questions and, and so on. So I'm going to stop the share and um, look, look if there for, for questions and comments and so on. And um, you can... Um, Feed them to to um, to Victoria or to Joel. Okay, no no questions as of yet. Okay, well then then I, I will I will do another one. If you have questions, please. Okay, uh, I, I will I'll go back to the sharing here, and and we'll do we'll do another. Uh, Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. Our 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 uh, our fourth thing is an invitation to. To move beyond tribalism to a whole number, okay. And I'll I'll, I'll try to do that in the next five or ten minutes to leave some time for questions. But uh, this is in Luke chapter fifteen. You know, this is a very unique chapter in Luke's gospel. Luke chapter fifteen has three stories, and you're familiar with them all, although we're more familiar with two of them. Luke says, Jesus says, um, a man has a hundred sheep and he loses one. He leaves the 99 in the wilderness and goes in search of the one. And when he finds it, he brings it back and he, with great joy and he, he's rejoicing. And he says, because there's more joy in heaven over one uh, sinner who converts than over 99 others who have no need of conversion. Okay, second story. A woman has 10 coins. She loses one. She goes frantic. She sweeps the house, lights lamps and so on. Uh, and finally she finds her coin and she's overjoyed and calls a party and probably spends more money than all the coins are worth. She said, I found my lost last coin. The last one, a man had two sons, a younger son and an older son. The older son took, the younger son took his inheritance, went out, spent it on prostitutes and drinking and gambling and stuff. Then when he's, he, he's down on his luck, he comes back home. The father meets him hugs him, gives him the finest robes and has a party for him. And the older son is in the field, he hears about this, he gets angry, he won't come in and so on. And the story ends with the father trying to plead with the oldest son to come in. Now, um, I wish I had spent the hour just on these three stories, you know. Um, first of all, what's common to these stories? In, 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 in all three of them, there's a question of wholeness. You know, a man has a hundred sheep. He loses one. He leaves the 99. Notice they're not on a safe place. He leaves them in the wilderness. He goes after the one and he finds the one. He's wonderfully happy. Why would he risk 99 for one? Well, it's in this. In Hebrews, it's in the numbers. In Hebrew, a hundred is a whole number and 99 is not a whole number. 
the, what's so important to the sh for the shepherd is that the whole group is together. It's got to be a whole number. The same with the second one. The woman, she has 10 coins. She loses a dime. It's not worth that much. But she can't rest until she finds it. Why? Because nine isn't a whole number. Ten is a whole number. You know, but let, let me talk about wholeness here. You know, if I would recast that story, you know, it's a, well, it was a woman has 10, 10 dimes. Imagine this. You could put it this way. There's a woman. She has 10 children. And it's Thanksgiving Day, and nine of them are home. They're at the table. And one daughter is not home. She's alienated. That mother can't rest and she can't sit still and she can't enjoy her, her Thanksgiving dinner and so on because somebody, one of the daughters is at the table. Then the phone rings, the daughter phones, happy Thanksgiving, mom, and so on. Then the family's complete. She can sit down and eat Thanksgiving dinner. Man has two sons. They're both out of the house. The house means heaven. He's trying to get an end to the house, but they the first youngest son is out through weakness. The oldest son is out through anger. He's trying to get him into the house, wholeness. You know, there's, there's a tremendous challenge that I want to pour out today. That, you know, today there's so much tribalism. There's so much nationalism. There's so much false patriotism, not just the United States, in all countries. You know, my tribe, my whatever, you know, my ethnicity, my religion, my country, and so on. Um, we're not whole numbers. We're bluntly put, you know, I'm a Roman Catholic. When I go to church on Sunday, Roman Catholicism is not a whole number. All of Christianity makes a number, not Roman Catholicism or anyone, you know, or, you know, you have so, so many people coming to church. Who isn't there? You know, like the mother, which daughter isn't at the table? Um, you know, like, it's interesting with these stories, they end with the father, which is God, out pleading with the angry son to come in, to get the family together, to have a whole number. And to, so th th this is a very deep uh, set of, st of stories with many other lessons to them and so on. Uh, incidentally, if you notice, those are three stories of God. And the first one, God is a man. The second one, God is a woman. The third one, God is a man. But just the importance of wholeness. You know, uh, there's deeply disturbing trends in the churches some years ago where they talk about, you know, uh, somebody, they're a Catholic light, you know, there comes the church. Well, they're not a real Catholic anyway. It's awful. It's awful. Um, or I'll probably get killed for saying this, but for instance, ecumenism, you know, at our school here, 15 years I've been here, every year we put on a day or, or a night of prayer for to pray for Christian unity. And in the 15 years I've been here, I think only three times as a seminarian ever come to that. Not that they're against the cumulative, it's just not that important. We're about Roman Catholics, you know? Um, see, it's not a whole number. Okay, I'm gonna stop to share. I noticed there were, there were, there were some questions now and we can go back to um, the question box. It's Father Ron, I have a couple yeah. of questions here. I'll start with one. Um, maybe just some suggestions for giving up or giving away the last three mansions in our lives. That was the person's question. Any suggestions for giving up or giving away the last three mansions in our lives? Yeah. Um, and I want to go back to that young man's story. Remember, he said he decided the car driving back from his dad's funeral. I'm going to do this. He said, then he realized I couldn't. I couldn't. He said I had to learn what alcoholics and people learned. You can't just change your life by willpower. Although willpower is important, you have to change it by grace and community. So that basically to do this, um, you know, first of all, talk to somebody, you know, but for, for first of all, there has to be humility to admit, you know, which are the houses that, which are comp compensatory areas, which are the houses that, you know, we're, we're not giving over, you know, and maybe with a good confessor or a spiritual director, or also a good counselor, or also a good friend, so on. Um, uh, see, so it's something that, that we need help with, you know. But I would say that at this stage, start with a confessor or a spiritual director and go and say, help me with this. First of all, help me to name the houses that I'm not giving over or the rooms. And, um, and then, 
maybe link me with some people, with somebody else. You know, notice they can only do this because they do it together. Now it requires great trust. But really, if you know, if we had true groups like this, you know, groups who could like that trust each other the way A people and, and other 12 step groups, they trust each other. And and so and and it's also it's so much based on honesty, confession, so that uh, um, you know that uh, all this 12 step healing is predicated on honesty. You know, first of all, admitting I'm weak, I'm weak. Yeah. Um, I can't stop myself from doing this. You know, I can't hand this house over. Someone's got to help me. Some higher power has to help me, and so on. So I'd say that the first step is find a good confessor or a good spiritual director and begin to talk, how can I make this happen? It's a wonderful question, thanks. Wonderful, um, the next one is more of a pastoral question, a pastoral situation, just someone talking about having grown children who aren't baptized and uh, when they come forth to ask to have them baptized, of course they're directed to the process, the RCI process as usual. Um, and they just sort of ask the question, why not just get baptized? Well, I'm, not, I'm glad you've worded it as a pastoral question. It's a pastoral question. And, and also theologians and oftentimes don't agree with pastoral people on this and so on. So there's, there's many ways you can slice this. You know, um, first of all, uh, as, a, as a, you know, as, as you may, you have a right to the sacraments. So, um, you know, you know, okay, I want to speak for parishes. They're, they're pushing these programs because the programs are good. They're saying like, you know, don't do this second rate. Do a program and really initiate yourself into this community and so on. Um, that's the best way to do it, okay? Um, and I believe that's the way it should be done. But sometimes people aren't able to do the best. And so you do what's next best. Um, you know, there's a moral theologian in the Boston College, Lisa Cahill, and she has some wonderful examples, I guess. So Lisa Cahill said, imagine this. Um, somebody comes to you, you're a dietitian, and you're going around the country giving talks about what's the most ideal diet that you can have. And, uh, and you preach like this. And so when you're finished, someone says, well, what should I eat? I'm a diabetic. I'm on chemotherapy. So, well, you eat whatever you can keep down, you know. Um, See, so that not everybody, you know, there's the ideal, but not everybody can live the ideal. And see, so parishes are pushing the ideal, and that's to their credit, you know. Um, and um, th th that's why they're saying you've got to go through these programs. Well, because ideally you should, you know. Um, but sometimes people can't or they won't. Oftentimes it's a deal breaker. Um, my own pastoral judgment, then I'd say, okay, I'll, I'll baptize your kid if that's, you know, I'd like you to do something more ideal, but, you know, if this, if this is all you can do, it's all you can do, you know. You know, I had a friend of mine, he came to me last year, said some, this young guy I taught, and he says, uh, to get his daughter baptized, and he said he went to the local parish priest, and the local parish priest said, look, I know you don't come to church, his wife isn't a Catholic, and he says, uh, but he said, I'll make you a deal. He said, if you come six Sundays in a row, I'll baptize your kid. <laughs> and this young man didn't take it. I said, you should have taken that deal. You know, that's not, a, that's not that, not that he's asking, it's not asking that much, you know. So anyway, I ended up baptizing a kid, you know, um, in, in a church, but, you know, some, some pastors sure go ahead and so on. It's not ideal, but sometimes you do what the next best thing to the ideal. Kids baptized. Okay. Wonderful. There was a comment with a bit of a question with it. Uh, back to where you just ended just a moment ago where you stopped. You said that Christianity is a whole number. And the question is, would all of us, would all of humanity be the whole number? Yes. And, you know, as soon as I said that, I realized that, that there's a certain wholeness to Christianity, but then Christianity is not whole. It needs Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism. It needs New Age. It needs humanity as a whole number, you know, and everything else is less than the whole number, you know. But see, Christianity is such a, it's a, it's a, it's wholer than just one denomination. 
it's more whole than just Roman Catholic or Episcopalian or Evangelical. You know, it's 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 not a whole number, but it's um, it, it's it's a whole in terms of at least for 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 Christianity. But then it gets bigger. You need all of, all of humanity to make a whole number. Good. Um, one question just asked if you could reflect a little more, uh, expound a little bit more on the scripture with the role of the, of the dogs, the scripture passage you were referencing earlier. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's an intriguing passage, you know. Okay, let, let me go back to where, kind of the, the points I, I, I kind of brought out. One of them is, you, you know, from that entire passage, you get an idea that Jesus and this woman liked each other. You know, like sometimes you have conversations with people and it's really fragile as glass. If you speak wrong, you know, everything's going to fall apart and they're going to be accused of this. And, that. and sometimes you can have a pretty robust conversation where people dish it out, take it, and so on. And you get the impression that Jesus and this woman, they had a very robust, uh, healthy kind of, you know, a give and take to them, you know. See, and so that, so that part of the, the surface thing is banter. But under the surface, this is a very important text. See, Jesus is saying, I'm the Jewish Messiah. You're not a Jew. And for me to do this for you, I would have to leave my Jewishness. I would have to leave my role as a Messiah. I'd have to step out of the house. You know, um, I'd have to step outside of my number. And she says, no, you're not just the Jewish Messiah. You're also the universal savior for all people, and I'm one of all people, so I'm already in your house. You can slip me the crumb. You don't have to get up and leave the house, you know. So I used the example I used before. So a Buddhist comes to me, young Buddhist, and his girlfriend said, we would like you to marry us. I said, well, you're not even Christian. Why? You know, I said, well, they said, we're not sure what we believe in, but we, we like Roman Catholic uh, marriage. We think that's a God blesses that, and we'd like to have this kind of blessing, you know. Well, as a, as a son of David, Roman Catholic is saying, I can't do this for you, you know. Uh, you know, uh, I can't give you a Roman Catholic marriage service. You're not even baptized, you know. Um, that's the prerequisite for the sacraments and so on. Um, but then they're saying, but, you know, sure, you're a Roman Catholic priest, but aren't you a man of God? So yeah, well, that's it. If, if you're a man of God, we're children of God, like, um, why couldn't you do this? See, I'm saying I'd have to leave the Roman Catholic house to do this for you. And they're saying, no, you don't. You know, uh, you're a Roman Catholic priest, but you're also a man of God, or you're, in case of a woman, you're a woman of God. So, um, so you can't do it as a Roman Catholic priest, you can do it as a person of God, you know. Uh, do, do you see the difference? So the, the woman's saying, I'm already in the house. You don't have to leave the house. You don't have to step out of Judaism to do this thing for me. These Buddhists say, you don't have to step out of Roman Catholicism to do this for us. You know, we're already in your house. Because part of being a Roman Catholic priest is also being a man of God. We're all children of God. See, now, again, that's a tension. That's meant to be a tension that we don't just see. You know, if you're liberal, say, well, I'll do it. If you're conservative, say, I won't do it. You know, it's, it's not a question of being liberal or conservative. It's a question of assessing and seeing, like, what is God calling me to do? Which loyalty do I lean on? Do I lean on, I'm a Roman Catholic priest. I can't do this for you. It's against canon law, so on. Or do I say, I'm a man of God. You're very sincere. God would want this, and I do it. See, so that's the tension. It was a tension with Jesus. It was a tension with Paul in the early church, you know. Did he go to the Gentiles? Are we just for the Jews? Who's going to make up the church and so on? Um, but it was a powerful tension for Jesus. And so it should be a powerful tension for us. I don't know if that's helpful, but... Um, yes, thank you for shedding a little a, more light there, on that, Father Ron. There, there's a lot to that dog story. Okay. Wonderful. Another uh, question, just in terms of being on the borders but still needing grace to give the entire house the question what do you recommend for gay couples who are legally married who go to church and try to be universal instruments of salvation but who find complete unacceptance of their relationship and marriage in the church 
Well, there's two answers for that. One of theoretical, one's practical. I'll do the practical one first. Go to a community, and there are a lot of communities who will accept you. So go to a community, uh, a parish community and stuff that's accepting, and there are many of them are. Uh, the, the, the theoretical question is, is unanswerable. And I'm just going to quote Pope Francis. They asked him that question. Pope Francis said, who am I to judge? Who am I to judge this? You know, um, and um, and he wasn't just being trite or superficial. You know, in uh, in John's gospel, at one point, Jesus says, I judge no one. He said, God judges no one. He says, doesn't mean there isn't judgment. He said, light, truth, love, they come into the world and we, we judge ourselves. We judge ourselves against light, truth, and love, you know. And so um, my answer to that, it's a good question. Thanks for asking. It's a courageous question. Uh, pastorally, find a place, find a parish that's accepting. And there are, there's many of them, you know. Theoretically, I don't have an answer for that, you know. Um, um, you're living in good conscience. Remember, the, Pope Francis said, if somebody is living in good conscience and they're living love, then said, who am I to judge? Um, I can't go better than that, you know, and, and uh, sure you can say, well, the Catholic catechism says this is an intrinsic wrong and so on. Um, incidentally, the Catholic catechism and a lot of Catholic morality, and I'm not going to say this superficially, it's predicated on a certain metaphysics, which if you understand the metaphysics and you predicate it on the metaphysics, it can make sense. But when you take it out of the metaphysics, it's offensive. It sounds offensive. So well, this is an intrinsic evil. Two people love each other. You know, they, 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 uh, inside of a certain metaphysics, and we had some hours we could go through this, you have to understand Aristotle and a few other things and what intrinsic and extrinsic and how they mean all of this. Um, it can make some sense inside of that metaphysics. As soon as you pull it out of that metaphysics, um, it no longer makes sense because it doesn't make sense outside of metaphysics. And it can sound very offensive where you say like you're, you're, you're committing a sin every time you, you get together and so on. Uh, so that's so that um, pastorally, it's resolvable. Theoretically, it's your conscience. Stay true in conscience. Stay true in love, and like Jesus said, I judge no one. Judgment is made, but you judge yourself against truth, against love, and so on. But thanks for that question. Brother Ron, could you speak of some ways that lay people could put into practice the new maturity that you spoke that you're speaking about in their daily lives? How can lay folks practice this new maturity in daily living? Well. You know, okay, I, I think first of all, remember I said we, we begin, that's a process, you know. Um, see, you, you don't, uh, I guess you can practice maturity, we never quite get to it, but it, first of all, it, we need to begin, again, like I said, the same thing with uh, giving up the rooms in your house. You, you might want to begin with a good confessor or a spiritual director or even a good counselor to say, like, like, uh, where am I struggling to... to so we only begin to be mature when, when we can name the areas of immaturity. When I can name the areas of immaturity in my life, I can begin to work at it, you know? So for instance, again, this stuff isn't abstract. So a person like Henry Nowen says, um, if I'm alone in a hotel room and there's pornography on television, it's gonna be one heck of a temptation for me, okay? Well, first of all, that's a humble admission a lot of people say, well, I have no trouble with it, you know. Well, pornography is the biggest addiction in the whole world. It seems people do have trouble with it, you know. Um, you know, or young kids with sexuality. So, oh, I, I'll trust myself. I'll go on a weekend with this person and so on. Well, I wouldn't trust the Pope on that weekend and so on. Um, see, so it, it begins with a kind of an honesty, you know. See, so we, we have to name our immaturities and to, you know, get in touch with them, you know. And, um, and, and, and and say, okay, then we pray. Remember, this is uh, um, yesterday's text, I think, in, that, in, in, in the gospel, where Jesus says, uh, uh, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit 
or I think it's Thursday's text. You know, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit if somebody asks for it? You know, so the Holy Spirit is pure spirit of charity, joy, peace, patience, absolute maturity. We pray for maturity, but then again, we need help. We need help. You know, we um, um, whether it's counseling, whether it's friendship, whether it's some kind of support group, um, um, because we can't often change our life we can't do it easily through willpower you know i can't let, let's just take something someone says I, I have trouble with my temper well i'm never going to get angry again made a resolution well no i'm going to get angry again you know uh, or i'm never with anything you know we, we can make the resolution be sincere have our hand on the bible uh, and then two days later it's going to happen again you know uh, remember the a great line in in the movie um the famous movie uh, on on uh, Henry the Eighth, you know, Man for All Seasons, where young Richard tells Thomas More, he said, "You can hire me." He said, "I'll be faithful. I'll be faithful." And More said, "Richard, you couldn't speak of yourself as far as tonight, not alone for the rest of your life." You know, I think we all know what that means. You know, um, I'm never going to lose my temper again. I'm never going to do this again, and so on. Um, we can't speak for ourselves. For this week not alone for the rest of our lives so um, but but all conversion begins with the admission of sin you know there's a great line which i didn't give you you know in in that that luke text the luke text about the whole number where the man has the 99 sheep and he finds the one that's lost and he brings it back and then the text says there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who converts than over 99 righteous people who have no need of conversion so this is my question. Does God love sinners better than righteous people? Seems to say it. He said there's, there's more rejoicing over one sinner who converts than over 99 righteous people who have no need of conversion. Well, it's a trick question. God doesn't love sinners better than righteous people. There are no righteous people. We are all sinners. So God can love us better when we admit we're sinning. See, so the first stage is always to be, I'm weak, I'm immature. And then that's the first steps towards maturity and so on. But but it's it's honestly, this is more than anything else what our kids need from us. Our kids need to see us walking uh, with freedom, you know, that we're not uptight and we're not, uh, just, you know, you're a free woman, you're a free man, uh, like Jesus. Um, he went everywhere, but he didn't sin. You know um, that we can show me you can walk, you can live with ten thousand TV channels and all this stuff, but you can control it. You can do it, and so on. Um, or you can have all these electronic gadgets, but you know when it's time to shut it off. You know there's other things you need to do, and so on. Thanks for the question. Yeah, and one more, Father. Uh... What's the real value of tribalism if it is actually only advocating for something less than the whole? That's the question. The real value of tribalism if it is only advocating for something less than the whole? That's a very, very good question. Um, see, okay, well, first of all, today we use the word tribalism pejoratively, but it's not necessarily pejorative, you know? Um, see, so anything, let's take anything like, say, patriotism, nationalism, ethnicity, they can be very, very healthy, you know, um, to a point, you know, see, so that, see, we, we as human beings, we need to be grounded in, in, a, in a local identity, you need to be grounded, you know, in a family, in a religion, in ethnicity, in a country, and so on, you know, but you may not close it off, see, tribalism, pejoratively, it closes it off, so like, um, if I say I'm an American and I couldn't give a rip about the rest of the world, see that I'm a tribalist. You'd say, I'm a proud American, but I'm also proud that we're generous people and we care for others and we take care of immigrants and we give to the world and, and so on. See, you'd say, I'm proud of my family, or I'm a proud Roman Catholic, but I'm going to be very open ecumenically, you know, see, so that we, 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 we can be proud, we can root in our biological family, in our faith family, in, our, in our, our national family, our local family. You can be a proud San Antonio and proud of the Spurs and so on. Um, and that can be very healthy. That's tribalism that's healthy. Um, it, when it becomes exclusive, you know, 
and today it often does, you know, where countries and stuff are just sealing themselves off and say, let the rest of the world go to hell. You know, we're going to take care of ourselves. See, um, or, or when we claim God for ourselves, you know, nobody who isn't a Roman Catholic is going to go to heaven. Nobody who isn't an evangelical is going to go to heaven and so on. Um, nobody who's, uh, who isn't straight is going to go to heaven and so on. See, that's tribalism where we, we, we claim God for, for ourselves and for our own group. So again, tribalism can be good. And there's a good tribalism, there's a good nationalism, there's a good, you know, ethnicity and so on. There's a good denominationalism and there's a bad one, you know, that, um, for instance, patriotism. Patriotism is a wonderful thing. When we forget about the rest of the world, it's an awful thing. It's an idolatry, you know, and, uh, so it can be good, it can be bad. Thanks for the question. That's a, that's a key one. Okay. I think we're right at time for the run, and we pretty well yeah. looked at the questions here. So we want to just thank you for leading us into these deeper gospel invitations tonight, your presentation, Father Ron. We thank you, and we thank everyone for their participation here tonight in the Zoom meeting. We invite you to join us again next Tuesday, October 13th, 7 p.m. Central here for Father Ron's second of three presentations in the series. So we wish you a good night and may God bless you. Okay, thank you.